Uh, once again, I am Betsy Moore, Director of Programs at the Jewish Women's Archive, and it is my pleasure to introduce tonight Dr. Beth Harmar. Uh, welcome. Hi, really nice to see you there. <laughs> uh, wish I could be there in person, but here we go. <laughs> Well, thank you for being here this way. It is an honor to talk to you as the writer and director of this incredible film. My name is Andrea. I wanted to start out by asking you, what drew you to Andrea Dworkin as a subject for a film? Um, yeah, um, I, you know, would never ever have imagined I would make a film about Andrea Dworkin. Um, but um, I had been, the idea got pl pl planted in my head by a couple of producers here in the UK. Um, and I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't think so, but let me read her work. And so I actually read two of her books. Um, I read uh, Mercy and I read her memoir, Heartbreak. Um, and that's kind of, you know, completely turned me around. I really fell in love with the words on the page. I fell in love with her as a writer um, and also her life story. The, the fact that he was a woman who had a, a deep desire to be a poet and a writer, yet at every turn in her life, uh, that desire had been thwarted. Um, and I could see, you know, that there are parallels for so many women in the world who wanna, you know, embody their desires, live out their, um, you know, dreams of being writers or what, whatever, poets. And, you know, there are so many things uh, along the way that stops women um, physically from being able to do that. Um, and so I just thought her story was fascinating. She was fascinating and also, I think one of the other things was that what I knew of her was that she had been so incredibly misrepresented. Um, and, and I discovered a whole other Andrea. And so I wanted to make a film where other people could discover this whole other Andrea too. Well, I can certainly say that from my point of view, you were incredibly successful in doing so. I learned so much about Andrea Thorkin, and even as someone who is a scholar of this period of feminism. Uh, it was remarkable seeing the footage you found, the recordings of her voice. Um, what surprised you the most? What do you feel like was most striking to you as something that was true about Andrea Thorkin and that was not known and that was uh, misrepresented in her public image? Um, gosh, so many things. I think one of the things that I was really surprised by um, in a really good way was um, the way in which her feminism had been completely and totally shaped by so many other historical, social, political movements, so that it was her involvement in the anti-Vietnam War movement, her um, you know, awareness of and being active in the civil rights movement, um, and her reading of uh, African-American intellectual thinkers and political thinkers uh, like, you know, I mean, she also was in correspondence with Hugh Newton about poetry at one time and, um, and you know, reading James Baldwin um, and then Fran Franz Fanon. And those were the things that really surprised me that I didn't know that she had. Uh, those were her formative people, th formative thought leaders. And, um, and I think that that, the depth of her intellectual thinking, the depth of her engagement philosophically with the bigger questions about existence and about life and about equality, fundamentally about equality um, and why her guiding question really always was, why are women not seen as fully human? And, and I think that that's kind of, those were the things that really surprised me about her. I was so struck in the film by her drive toward humanity, toward her own humanity and toward the humanity of others. And it's something that you see in a number of stories of women who were part of the second wave of feminism, that they had aspirations that they saw as human, that 
were then thwarted by their womanhood and by the patriarchal response to their womanhood. And her drive toward humanity was so striking in that way. And I really appreciated your pulling that out. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the research process for this film. How did you go about finding the footage and clips and documents that you drew on? Um, well, you know, we um, had, uh, well, first of all, uh, the producer Shaheen Hack is an incredible sleuth and she found a lot of the archival uh, footage, but also we came to uh, Boston and we uh, spent a week looking through Andrea Dawkins archives at Radcliffe. Um, and, you know, they were very, very helpful. And I hope some of them are there in the audience tonight to see uh, when we were demanding some of those <laughs> archival images, et cetera, what we finally ended up using them as. Um, and so, you know, it was a combination of uh, uh, Dawkins archive and her papers, but also doing a whole kind of other kind of, um, you know, uh, research, archival research also. And John Stoltenberg, you know, he was incredibly helpful by opening up the uh, home movies footage of Andrea as a child with her family. Uh, and, you know, that was just incredibly important. When I first saw it, I was like, this, I have to use this because it really uh, shows us um, the young Andrea, but also the loving family that she was so much a part of. And I think that that was a big foundational sort of, you know, um, for her, it was a, a huge that this love that she got from her family, I think that was really uh, formative for her. That footage was remarkably joyful. It was so beautiful. Yeah. Yes, and shout out to archivists everywhere, may I just add, uh, at the Schlesinger and elsewhere, um, and those who keep the documents alive at home as well. Um, can you, since I've asked about how you got all of the documentation and footage and recordings, can you talk a little bit about how you approached constructing the film? How did you decide to approach this as an active film and documentary? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think from the get go, I because I didn't really know at the beginning what kind of archival footage there was going to be, what I would have access to, what would be available in terms of the archive. So I actually wrote a screenplay and I read all of uh, Andrea's books. I went through all her uh, many of the radio interviews that she'd done and we got transcripts of those radio interviews, television appearances, um, interviews she'd done in print. And then I used everything she says about her own life through her books and through the interviews and crafted a screenplay basically with these five chapters. Um, I always knew that I wanted to uh, just have you know, these diff five different actresses and five different decades of her life. Um, so the script really was my starting point. And, um, and then when we began to do the archival research and started to find all the material, uh, the, you know, I, it was in the editing process that I kind of just uh, with my different editors kind of melded the two. Um, and I think one of the things that I kind of really uh, wanted to, for the film to be um, was also not just a sort of, well, which it clearly isn't a talking heads, uh, you know, polemical um, film. I kind of wanted to use the language of uh, cinema, uh, emotions, you know, images, uh, the music, uh, all of these different things that help us to kind of really get inside the subjective point of view of all of our actresses who, who evoke different aspects of Andrea Dawkin. I didn't want it to be the sort of objective eye we're looking in on her life, but I wanted us to be able to experience um, her life as it was unfolding from within. Um, and so that was really crucial to me that it was kind of, it was a subjective experience and it was an, that it was also an emotional experience and that she, the space was created for her to speak about her own life in the, her own words. 
the theme of voice and voicelessness and being heard or being not heard is so striking in this film. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about what that means to you as a filmmaker, what that means to you personally. Um, how did, what resonated with you about those themes of voice and voicelessness? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. You know, I think that that's um, uh, the whole theme about being, becoming mute and not having the language to be able to speak about what had happened to her. Uh, and she speaks about that a number of different times in her lives when she experienced uh, sexual and physical assault, that how she didn't have the words to describe what had happened to her. And I think that that's key, that, you know, language is really key in, in all of us, and particularly, uh, you know, those of us who, uh, who different genders and uh, uh, who, who are under attack and how do we find the language to speak about how we're experiencing those attacks on our bodies and I think that uh, it's something that's you know ongoing I mean right now I you know I would say that you know so many trans people are under attack and there is a way in which language is being used against trans people and I think that you know it's this uh it's a constant kind of vigilance that we have to keep um as um and and look at the language you know look at the language that's describing us look at the language we use to describe ourselves and also come in community with each other in order to be able to find the language that will empower us rather than uh take away our sovereignty and our agency I could not agree more. Um, that is also what we strive to do at the Jewish Women's Archive. We believe very much in amplifying voices, some of which have been heard before and some of which have not. And so I thank you so much for this incredible film. I want to open it up to the audience. Would anyone like to ask a question of the director? Yes, if you tell me the question, then I will read it back for I'll tell you. Exactly. So my question is about um, the sexuality of Andrew's work. Mm. It's a bit mysterious in the movie. I know the the, the, the twenty year relationship with John. He was openly gay, and and I think I I can't say. I think she was at least partly a lesbian, and that's I wonder why that isn't explored. What what positive sexuality she had. In we have a question from the audience about Andrew's work in sexuality and how you chose to discuss or not discuss that aspect of her in the movie, especially in the later half of her life and her partnership. Would you be willing to speak to that? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite hear that, especially in her- Oh, in the, in the latter half of her life um, and in her relationship and her long partnership. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one of the things was that um, there was there's there's always been this kind of idea about Andrea Dawkins as being man hating or as being somebody who was asexual uh, or that she was a lesbian. And, you know, in in my uncovering of her life, she I found that she'd defined herself as a lesbian at one particular moment in her life. Um, but she had no significant lesbian relationships. And she actually said, I'm, I define myself as a lesbian because it's a political definition and it's in solidarity with women who are lesbians. Um, but, you know, the biggest love of her life was John Stoltenberg. And, and I think that that was really important to me that, you know, that love between them uh, was something that that was such a big part of her story that you can't I could not tell it um but also you know when she fell in love with um the her first husband Ivan in uh, Amsterdam you know that whole passage uh, the voiceover about making love with him again for me that was really important to show that he was Andrew Walkin who is who had people have had certain kinds of ideas about who was actually a very sexual being 
um, and who could use words and describe uh, the sexual act, heterosexual sexual act, and her own passion and her own desire and her own lust in this kind of very bold way. Um, and I think that that kind of goes against a lot of the kind of stereotypes and misrepresentations of her. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I, I knew Andrea at, uh, in Minneapolis at the time of working on Fortunes and found her wonderful, warm, delightful company. And I'm wondering, I mean, in line with the last question, the two relationships that are warm and loving are really are her father and John Stoker. And I'm wondering in particular whether you reached out to Catherine McKinnon in the making of this film and, and spoke with her. Um, an audience member asks, uh, notes that she knew Andrea in Minneapolis when they were working on the ordinance and what a warm and welcoming person she was. And she asks, um, the kind of most warm relationships we see in this film that Andrea has um, are with her father and with John. And she asks, did you reach out at all to Catherine McKinnon um, in making this film? to speak with her about Andrea. Yeah, yeah, Kitty, I mean, Catherine McKinnon's been incredibly supportive from the get-go. And, you know, I met with her when we were doing the research for the film. She knew the, she loved the idea of how I was approaching telling Andrea's story with these actresses and the hybrid approach. Um, and, um, you know, because the film isn't about, it doesn't interview anyone at all. Um, you know, it. I didn't. It, I wasn't going to break that uh, formal approach that I developed um, for the film. Uh, but uh, but Catherine is in the film, as you know, in that archival footage, and you can see the two of them together um, working on the. You know, being interviewed on on TV about the ordinance. So you know, yes, Catherine uh, McKinnon knows. Uh, us knows the film um, and you know she started to watch it and she said she just was really emotionally moved because she really misses she said she wrote to me and she said I really miss my friend you know so yeah that's thank you does anyone have any other questions for Patrick? Yes. The, the handling of controversy within the feminist movement around the LGBT, which is important, I thought it was handled with a lot of delicacy, and I just wondered if you would be willing to speak about how we should decide and how to handle it. An audience member asks, how did you decide to handle the discussion of the controversy within feminism about pornography and conversations about heterosexual sex? Um, well, it's there in the film. <laughs> That's how I handled it. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, again, it was something um, that I gave a lot of thought to because that was the one thing that Andrea Dworkin was known for. Um, she wasn't known for a lot of those other things that the film shows. And so I, but also I made a very um, conscious decision for the film not to be just about that, because I think that there is so much that has been written about the pornography debate, written about the from people who were on different sides of that argument uh, uh, and the different sides of the controversy. And for me, it did not feel in any way generative to be to kind of go back on this discussion, which was very much in a particular historical moment. So if we're gonna look at the question of pornography, then it's an entirely different world that we are living in right now in terms of pornography. And that, that debate and that discussion was a very specific debate and a very specific discussion in a very particular moment in time. And this film is not, a historical 
uh, documentary, I was very, um, again, I was very conscious that I wanted this film to speak to our contemporary moment and, and how it speaks to our contemporary moment, particularly in terms of violence against women and the way in which patriarchal systems are kind of repeatedly and globally um, have been responsible for uh, the inequality that women are experiencing, but the rise in uh, uh, the violence that women are experiencing all over the world. And so I think that there was, it was a judgment call on my part as a filmmaker, a very conscious decision here. I mean, that is a, actually the film, the documentary has quite a lot on the pornography debate. Yes. Uh, Andrea has her say, and you know, there's also the alternative point of view from Feminist Against Censorship uh, that Carol Vance uh, advances in the film through archival material. So I think it gives people enough information about the fact that, you know, this was a, a, a kind of a red hot topic at the time and that there were all these different kind of aspects to it within feminism. But I think, to dwell on it is a whole other film. And that's not the film that I was making because that, and that's a film somebody could make and you know that could be potentially interesting, but that's not what I was interested in. I was interested in revealing an Andrew Dawkins that many people haven't seen before. Speaking of the current moment, I was so struck by how prescient some of her statements about the pervasiveness of violence against women, about the pervasiveness of rape and sexual harassment, felt in light of the ongoing conversations around Me Too and sexual violence that uh, have you know, preceded 2017 and the Me Too eruption um, and have been going on before that that have really come to light in the last few years. Um, while at the same time, her stance on pornography feels like it is from such a historically specific time, as you said. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, as to how those diverge and where you see her voice today, where you see it speaking to feminists today. Um, I think um, there's many things. I mean, it's, it's really interesting to me that having gone to a number of different film festivals and shown the film and been there in person for the Q&A that a number of times uh, young women have come up to me and said, we knew nothing about Andrea Dworkin. And this is like opened our eyes to what is possible in terms of feminist organizing. Or young women uh, came up to me after the screening at Tribeca where we had our world premiere earlier this year, um, you know, very tearful saying, you know, two young women saying we're survivors and we've never seen our story being told in this way before. And I, they said, when we feel seen, for the first time we feel seen. So I think that there's a whole number of different ways in which what Andrea had to say and what she was saying and how she was saying it is resonating for a lot of people, not just women, actually men too. Um, you know, we showed the film this week in London at the Rain Dance Film Festival, and a couple of guys came up to us afterwards, and they talked to us really in detail about how they felt deeply impacted as men by the film. Um, there is a group in the Bay Area that started after our screening in at the Castro in San Francisco, and a men's group has formed in terms of like, what can they do about combating sexism and misogyny and uh, violence against women? So I think that that's just the, you know, just those few examples that just shows that her, she's still very much relevant. She, she's still speaking to what men and women need to hear and want to hear. And I think one of the other things is her rage and her anger and, you know, she, and the fact that she did not mince her words and she said everything, she said everything in a very bold and blunt ways. And sometimes it was startling um, and some people couldn't hear it. But I think that that's, we are in a time right now where globally there's a war against women. And, you know, I think that we can't afford to kind of mince our words, really. I think that we have to, 
uh, take inspiration from someone like Andrew Dworkin and say, say what it is, you know, say it like it is and saying, this is what it is and this is what needs to happen. Um, and so I think there's many ways in which she speaks to us now. Thank you so much. I'm being told that it is time to wrap up. I think this is the perfect note to end on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to speak with you. It was a pleasure to screen your film and thank you so much for being here. And thank you so much to the audience for being here. I, yeah, I wish I could have seen the audience. It would have been lovely to have had a glimpse of the audience, but thank you all for coming to the screening and watching the film. And thank you for programming the film, Lisa. Um, and the Boston Jewish Film Festival. Really appreciate it. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>